Dave Tromeo back here for Latin Business Today and the uh, Sports Business Institute. And um, today I have a, a great pleasure of talking to really a legend in, in the uh, sports uh, landscape in terms of executives, uh, a, a gentleman who for years now, as many of you know, if you've watched some of the podcasts or some of the read some of the articles, I am a Mets fan. I grew up on Long Island and my dad, although was a Yankee fan, took me to Shea and as they say, the rest is history, but I would watch and consume any sporting event, including the Yankees, who I do not hate, uh, but I don't know why, why, why a lot of my fans go down that road, but the, but the watching picks 11 for many years, if you, if you watch the games, you saw the name Marty Appel, at least every single time you watch the game. So I knew the name for many years, knew he was the PR guy for the Yankees. And, and well, let me let him tell the story, Marty. I know you started, uh, literally answering mail from Mickey Mantle. Is that right? Yeah, I was uh, just 19 and I had been looking for a summer job and I decided to write a letter to the Yankees, seeing if there was any position there that I could work in for the summer. And what was in my favor, which I didn't fully realize at the time, was that baseball really wasn't very cool among teenagers. Football and basketball were taking hold. So I was the only letter they got. <laughs> and at the same at the same time, they needed uh, about eight cartons of mantle fan mail answered because it was bad PR not to answer it. Uh... So I went in for an interview, did fine, got hired and uh, got my foot in the door answering Mickey's fan mail. Which I should say, because everybody asks, was not all that interesting. <laughs> it was, you're Mickey, you're my favorite player. Please send me an autographed baseball. <laughs> um, so what I did manage to do was save up the occasional letters that weren't quite like that. Bar mitzvah invitations. <laughs> nice. Invitation to judge a beauty pageant. Whatever. Whatever gave me some Mickey Mantle time. <clears throat> so I would pull up the stool in the adjacent locker and spend 10 or 15 minutes with Mickey. He sort of saw through me and was amused by it. And uh, we struck up a friendship that lasted until he died in 1995. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. And obviously you've had relationships with obviously a lot of the Yankee greats and have written a lot of books. You you just finished your 25th book, which we'll get to in a second. But one of the books was um, somebody who, uh, you know, it was a character, but a, a great player and also tragically died young, uh, Thurman Munson. Um, yeah, I actually have two books out at the moment. And one of them is a reprint, a reissue of the autobiography I did with Thurman in 1978. Oh, uh -huh. He had uh, won the MVP award in 76. And I went to him and I said, somebody's going to do a book about you. You're not going to make any money off it. You're going to hate everything in it. The thing to do is do your own book and preempt that. Smart. So he wasn't enthusiastic like the world needed to hear his story. And he did hold a lot back. But we did do the book and... Subsequently, it became a bestseller after he passed away. And now a company called Diversion Books has reissued it all these years later. Um, and the other one, which we'll talk about, is uh, Pinstripes by the Tail. Right. But, um, just to finish the Thurman friendship. So 30 years after he died, which was 2009, my publisher came to me with the idea of a new biography, not an autobiography, obviously, but a biography of Thurman, which was called Munson. And it was, gosh, the, half the book was his career, and the other half was the events leading to and following his death and the legacy that he left behind. And the connection that fans have today, maybe even more than they did when he was an active player, it's really remarkable. Yeah. Very interesting. And uh, and I would just encourage, you know, the audience, um, you know, to, it, obviously Amazon has a list of all of your books. I, I always encourage people to shop locally if possible, bookstores, et cetera. But 
uh, if you just if you just go to Amazon and put in uh, Marty's name, you know, it, it's very easy and it's a p p e l, um, and you will see listed from top to bottom. Uh, a, a just a, 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 an amazing uh, congregation of, of of great books, including the Munson book. Uh, we're talking about, you know, uh, it, it's all a lot of Yankee stuff, obviously. Let's be honest. But I know there's I know there's more to you than just the Yankees. But let's finish up by by the book section by talking about the newest book. You you uh, pinstripes by the tail, half a century in and around Yankees baseball. And I got to tell you, I haven't received it. Mark Jeffers, who we do the radio show, didn't share his book with me, so I have to I have to order it. But I do love the cover from what I see here on Amazon. Well, I didn't think I had another book in me. Uh, I'll be 75 this summer, and I thought I was done. Had no more subjects that I was dying to do. Um, but my agent and my publisher both thought I'm a pretty good storyteller. And how about putting all my stories into a single volume? So the funny little thing that intrigued me about that was I have three young grandsons now in the Boston area, and I had never dedicated a book to them. There were only six and one and one twins. So, yeah, let me do one more book and dedicate it to the grandsons. Nice. And awesome. um, put all the stories down. It only took me four weeks because wow. there was nobody to interview. There was no research to do. It was just the stories I like to tell from 50 plus years in and around Yankee baseball. Some of them weren't even Yankee specific, but it couldn't have happened to me in my life like a night spent with John Lennon if I didn't have the Yankee connection somehow at work there. So anyway, I did it and turned it in. And I said to the editor on our first conversation, you know what, you're going to tell me that the stories need to better connect. There needs to be a thread from taking you from one to the other. And I want to tell you, five guys sitting around a table in Applebee's swapping stories, nobody cares about a thread. That's right. So it's just there. And those kind of books I like to read when I was younger. Short stories, lots of white space, lots of photos. And it worked. It's been very well received so far. I'm anxious for you to hear once you get your copy. Yeah. Well, actually, it is the number one uh, on Amazon uh, new bestseller. So it's uh, you're getting some traction. And I, I, I definitely look for it's going to be on my summer reading list for sure. Um, so um, but I have to ask, you know, I, I know books might be like children. You know, you have people say, you know, who's your favorite kid? And you say, of course, you can't answer that question. But is there a book, uh, maybe this is it, but maybe that you just say, man, that one, that's the cornerstone of my collection. Well, that would be the one from 2012, which has now been updated through 2020, called Pinstripe Empire. Gotcha. And that's the full history of the Yankees from their origins, 1903, till through 2020. Um, we got to do another edition and get Aaron Judge in there, though, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this there had not been a full narrative Yankee history since 1943, written by a great sports writer named Frank Graham, whose son I am still in touch with, Frank Graham Jr. Um, so Frank Graham did his in the 40s. And in 2010 or something, I suggested to my editor at Doubleday by uh, Bloomsbury, um, it's time for a full Yankee serious history. So when I say serious, that might sound like a little bit of a turnoff because it's kind of a light history as well. Looking at some of the characters that played a role in the Yankee development. And it was fun to write. It was a very serious and important project because I knew Yankee fans don't like mistakes, don't like errors, and don't want to say, how did you forget this? Or how did mm. you forget this? person. Yeah. I started that project actually making a list of every event that had to be in there and every person that had to be in there and then built around that and constructed the book chronologically. So that one was exceptionally well received and is considered the definitive history of the Yankees now. I'm really proud of that. You should be. And, and at the end of the day, um, I think it's tremendous that 
you were able to get all this out in in, in and for year for prosperity for 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 the history of not just the Yankees but for yourself because a lot of guys have these you know these experiences whether it's working in athletics or for a team or a, a league whatever it is and um they don't have that opportunity to share so it's great that you're leaving this legacy so to speak and 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 on behalf of a fan of the game uh thank you thank you for leaving it behind for us not that you're going anywhere you're 75 you look great you shared your age and that's um you know i think it's tremendous and i i applaud you for uh, uh, just a wonderful career and I, and and on that note i'd like to ask um, you know, I don't know where you went to college or, or what you were studying in college, but I think PR uh, was a very different ball game, obviously, back when you were doing it. And now, obviously, the technology and things, but it, but it's always about people and relationships, right? And and, and good, tight writing skills. So um, obviously, answering the mail at 19 it propelled you in some way to get into the PR side. Um, I'm very interested in that because I went down that road myself for a while. So can you talk about your career a little bit more? Sure. Um, I never anticipated going into public relations. I didn't take courses in that per se when I went to State University of New York in Oneonta. Um, but just this idea of a job with the Yankees without specifically thinking of PR, and I wind up in the PR department, and I learned from the best at the time. Bob Fischel was considered baseball's greatest PR man, may still be the case today. So um, when he left in 1973 after George Steinbrenner bought the team, Mr. Steinbrenner called me in and said, can you assume this job? Are you prepared to be a PR director of this franchise? I was only 23. Nobody that young had ever held such a position. Mm. But my answer was truthful. I said, I've learned for the last five years from Bob Fischel. It's like learning American democracy from Thomas Jefferson. Okay. So um, okay. to his great credit and to my lifelong lasting appreciation, he made me PR director of the Yankees at 23. Yeah. Putting me in position for all those Bronx Zoo years and the months oh, of the first three years. And <laughs> it was trial by fire, but yeah. uh, we got through it and I think uh, we handled it well. Yeah, for sure. Now, listen, you, you, you just just the mention of Steinbrenner, and obviously anybody who follows the Yankees knows Yankee history with the Billy Martin escapades and the, you know, the, I mean, the firing of the managers, uh, you know, just, must have been a real character. Obviously, I, I I did get a chance to meet George when I was at the National Football Foundation, and uh, a lot of people uh, do not know. I mean, they 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 see just like with anybody with Bobby Knight or whoever they see one side or they get they get one impression through the media lens, but they don't know the other things. And I know that 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 George Steinbrenner was a uh, a very uh, generous and philanthropic individual as he was, you know, dealing with the Football Foundation and, and um, Eddie Robinson, a lot of those things. So I'll just put that out there. But I don't know if you have a special story you want to share about George, Mrs. Steinbrenner, or anything like that. Just that what you cited was absolutely correct. He, he was a very tough boss. And uh, like many successful men, he had an ego, liked to be in the newspaper a lot. Yeah. And, he had a vision also that few people in the 70s had in sports, and that was the word branding. Mm. It wasn't really thrown around back then, but he saw almost immediately the power of the Yankee name, logos, usage, mm -hmm. everything. So today you walk around the globe and so many people are wearing Yankee caps. Oh, yeah. In a large sense, it's almost become an alternative to the American flag. I mean, it says, I'm a New Yorker, I'm a Yankee, mm -hmm. I'm an American. Uh, people aren't encouraged to walk around foreign countries waving an American flag, <laughs> but the yeah. Yankee cap seems to do that. Yeah, that's a good and, point. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. he had this vision of going global and branding the Yankee name and logos and, uh, he was way ahead of his time in doing that. Yeah, that's a that is a really good point. And um, so, 
Uh, and then the transition to to PIX, obviously, um, that was post Yankee, right? Or were you doing it in conjunction with your Yankee job? Well, I was obviously working closely with them as they right. were advising most of our games, and I was always in touch with the announcers and the mm -hmm. director and producer. So yeah. then um, the opportunity to go to work for them came, and I was I hadn't fully appreciated the broadcast industry. Yeah being enormously bigger than the sports industry and really important and really intricate. And I got hired as the PR guy for Channel 11 WPIX in New York and came to realize the scope of the broadcast industry and the individual stations, you know, news and community affairs and uh, yeah, just uh, everything. So now I was getting a rapid education in that. And when the opportunity came along to become the producer of the Yankee games, it was a natural fit. And uh, that worked out really well. I love that job. I love the connection of the Yankees. Mm. Unfortunately, we were losing games to cable TV. That was mm. just what was going on in America then. So yeah. finally, WPIX was down to 40 games. And the production was all being handled by the cable carrier. Gotcha. So that was the end of that run. Yeah. But it was great working with Phil Rizzuto and Bill White and uh, Frank Messer. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it's it's amazing, you know. And that and it was, you know, just as a pure fan of the game, you know, I, I was spoiled as a kid. I'll say this because watching, you know, you know watching all the Met games that I watched with with Lindsey Nelson and Ralph Kiner and Bob Murphy and then flipping the channel, watching the Yankees with Messer and White and Rizzuto and the, and the camaraderie that they had. And the, I mean, there's a lot of fun just watching that. They made those games so entertaining, you know, even if the teams weren't good. Um, yeah. But yeah. And Absolutely. I, I, by the way, I'm going to Mets game this week. Nice. Uh, and I'll be rooting for the Mets. Good. All right. Well, I appreciate that. You're but playing they're... Tampa Bay, so. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. That, that yeah. Well, that's going to be tough for them because they're not playing well right now. But that's another whole story. So it's a long season. I get it. But boy, oh boy, uh, I give Steve Cohen a lot of credit for being patient because I often think about what would George would be doing right about now with this team that he's paying all this money for, and they're just they're really not playing well. So. But I think we know the answer. <laughs> Something would have been done. But um, so, all right. So wrapping up, obviously, um, we know people can go to Amazon. I mean, obviously, the the, the books are there. Um, anything you want to say to the audience in terms of your career, the books, um, maybe something outside of baseball? Because I know you're a historian of other sports as well. Are you a, are you a New York Red fan through and through? Or is there some type of... I never understood when people said, especially growing up, growing up on Long Island when I was a kid. I get it more now with with the with the with the content that you can get anytime anywhere. That people would say I'm a Chicago Bulls fan and I live in in New York. I was like, well, I don't get that. And at least I get it now. But how about you? Well, I would say that people have an expectation of me that I root against the Mets and against the Red Sox, considered the two main rivals for Yankee fans, and it's not the case at all. I've nice. always been interested and always followed the Mets closely. Um, you know, on my apps for MLB, I have the Yankee and the Mets news and scores pop up constantly. And my son and my grandchildren live in Boston. And I've always had love for their ballpark and admiration for their culture, Red Sox Nation and so forth. So why... I get pleasure when the Yankees beat their rivals. I never specifically root against Boston teams. What a great year they they've had, yeah. and uh, and the Metsies. So yeah, that I you know I'm I'm in lockstep with you on that. I don't I don't. Uh... I took my son years ago when he was young um, to opening day at Fenway Park. You know, we're both Mets fans, but he and but he, it just so happened that the Mets and my my wife was on a mother daughter trip. So I said, let's go. We went to Boston. We had a few days in Boston. We did all the Boston stuff. I love the city. Yeah. And and uh, and then went to the uh, Red Sox home opener. So, yeah, I, I feel the same way. And that is a that is a great ballpark to spend time in as well. Um, so, Marty, I listen, I really appreciate you taking the time. Good luck with the book. 
um, and uh, book books and continuation of your career. Look forward to maybe collaborating in the future with you. Um, would love to stay in touch and, and just thank you for your time. Thank you. Pleasure being with you, Dave. All right, pal. Take care of yourself.